Hi, everybody. I'm really excited to be here. Um, I'm a little nervous, so <laughs> in case I drop down or something. Oh, it's, <laughs> it's intimidating being in front of an audience because you know now what? I have to give you knowledge. Anyway, so my name is Alexandru Nedelcu. I'm from Romania. Um, I'm uh, currently working for Eloquentix. We are a consulting company. We are pretty awesome. That's my uh, Twitter uh, account uh, where I rant on stuff, and that's my blog. And I'm here today, today to talk about Monix's task implementation. And to quickly describe Monix, it's a Scala uh, library. It's cross-compiled. Uh, it works with Scala.js in your browser if you want. Uh, I really hope that uh, Scala native support will uh, happen um, soon, but um, there are some technical challenges there. It's about composing asynchronous programs. That's how I like to describe it. Uh, it exposes, currently it exposes uh, observable and task. Um, it's a type level project with full membership, and for you this means that it adheres to certain standards of quality. Uh, currently at 2.3, and I hope version 3 will happen soon. And if you're looking for more information, monix.io is the address of the website. I, it also has some documentation. It's not perfect, but it's there. Anyway, um, so um, Monix task is often described as an alternative to future. And who here loves future? I sort of wonder. Yay! I love it as well. Seriously. Uh, but with, as with all concurrency-related uh, abstractions, there's no silver bullet, and there are certain contexts where feature makes sense, and there are certain contexts where feature doesn't make sense. And to quickly um, describe it, future does not make sense for um, controlling side effects, which is what we often want to do in functional programming, controlling side effects as in to suspend them and push them to the edges of the program. Uh, future is also um, sometimes problematic for uh, when you want uh, good throughput. This is because future pref futures implementation uh, prefers to be um, to provide fairness and to push that concern to the execution context. And because of its nature, it doesn't do, in my opinion, good error handling. And Monix's task is actually a complementary. Personally, I don't view it as a um, replacement. I view it as a complementary, and they've got good um, interoperability, as, as you'll see. It's a type for describing lazy, possibly asynchronous um, computation. It's effective at uh, dealing with side effects. It's effective at controlling side effects. For those familiar with Haskell, Scala's task is, the Monix task is basically equivalent to the IO type in Haskell, and it's effective at dealing with concurrency. Um, one extends on the shoulders of giants, and it was inspired by the Scala Z task implementation and by Haskell's I.O., and it also has alternative in the, uh, alternatives in the type-level ecosystem, such as FS2 task and uh, the new CATS effect I.O. Uh, project. Uh, I'm also involved, involved in that. Uh, Monix's task comes with certain advantages, as you'll, as you'll see. But first, let's talk a little about evaluation. Evaluation in Scala. In Scala, Scala is an eager language, so uh, expressions are uh, evaluated as soon as the interpreter sees them. So um, all expressions are eager, and to turn them into something lazy, uh, to turn them into something lazy to delay their evaluation, you turn them into a function with zero arguments, also, also called the thunk. So this is actually a really effective way to turn something eager into something lazy. You turn it into a zero arguments function. And this also works for asynchronous processing. So 
if we want to describe a sync asynchrony with a type, you describe it with something that takes a callback that will be invoked when that external process is going to finish processing. So asynchrony is about external process, external processing happening on another thread, on another node on the network, and so on. And uh, you're going to be called um, with a callback, with the result, when it's going to finish processing. You don't have a guarantee about when it's going to finish, and so on. So, and to turn, um, future is an eagerly evaluated value, let's say, when you, when you receive a future, uh, the, there's a pretty big probability that the process that's going to complete it has already started. That's what eager in this context means. It doesn't necessarily mean that the future is, is already complete. It just, it means that um, the, that process has already started. So to turn that into something lazy, you turn it into a function. And if you want to describe those with types, um, task is basically a function that returns future. Um, it's how you can describe it, how you can better think about it. It's about delaying the future. I actually wanted to call this talk delaying the future. It would have been better, I think. <laughs> so, uh, yes, you can view task as a lazy future. And usage is pretty similar, for, especially for the basic use cases. This is a sample where we capture um, an expression, a simple expression meant for didactical purposes. And in both cases, um, we call a function that takes a handler that will be invoked when the result is finished. Um, the difference in semantic here is that task will not execute anything until you call run async on it, whereas future will begin execution as soon as that future reference is built. Um, and so that's, the, that's actually the difference there. Task is lazy, it will, um, it will push execution until you actually call run async. Otherwise, it's just a description of a computation, uh, not something that is executing. So to summarize the behavior of Monix's task, it allows fine-grained control over the evaluation model, as you'll see. It doesn't trigger any effects until run async. It doesn't necessarily execute on, a, on another uh, thread from where you're calling it. Uh, it allows for canceling of a running computation. Now, when, when I describe these differences, To people familiar with task or with promise from JavaScript, it's sort of an adjustment, uh, an adjustment period, especially uh, because um, lazy future abstractions aren't that popular in other stacks. I mean, we are Scala developers. We borrow concepts from the cool languages. So, and about controlling the evaluation. These are a couple of samples. Task now initiates an already completed um, value, so it's, it's equivalent to feature successful. Eval once is the equivalent of lazy val in Scala, something that um, will be evaluated on the first run async, and that gives you the potency guarantees. Um, you um, are, have a guarantee that will be evaluated exactly once. Eval behaves like a function, so it, that logic will get called each time you run, uh, you do run a sync defer, defers the task, also behaving like a function, and fork is an explicit fork, meaning that a runnable will be sent in, in the thread pool. Uh, if you're running on the JVM or on top of JavaScript, you, it will trigger a set timeout or something that will do that execution um, asynchronously. I mean, not on the current core stack. So, memoization, this is something that Task does really well. Um, as I said, eval once behaves like a lazy val, and you can actually use it as such. In this case, eval once of increment and get will only increment that value only once, and then it will cache the result and uh, serve that for subsequent invocations, and eval will trigger that evaluation every time plus. You can 
do memoize um, the, the operation later. By the way, uh, memoize, actually I learned for, uh, about it when I was doing dynamic programming in high school, and it's about caching. So caching the results for subsequent calls of that function. Um, but when we are talking about futures, the future itself is a memoized value. So once you have a completed future, you can reuse that value multiple times, and you can be sure that execution will happen only once when you receive that future, and it takes care of multi-threading concerns. So the difference between run async, which in which Monix, uh, the Monix task implementation there it returns the future and doing a memoization like that, is laziness versus uh, eagerness. So memoize will happen when the task is actually being executed. Um, Plus, here's something that future cannot do easily. So sometimes you have like this use case where you want to cache the result of a computation only on success. So maybe you're doing a database query or a network call that can fail, and you want to cache that value, but you don't want to cache it uh, in case an exception happened, a timeout exception or a network exception or whatever. You want to keep retrying until the first successful value. And this operation, memoize on success, is provided by Monix's task implementation. And task can do that because task is a function that can retry a computation, right? So when you receive a task reference, you are receiving a function that you can call repeatedly, whereas when you receive a future, you receive a value that's not a function. Um, so when you're dealing with a future-based API, it's actually, I don't know if you've ever tried it, but it can get quite difficult, quite challenging. I mean, here I haven't used the correct language. You can do it with future, but it gets hard, and you can't build reusable abstractions for doing that. So yeah, task can do it because task is a function. Um, and speaking of evaluation, we often, in functional programming at least, we deal with tail recursive loops, with loops described as recursive calls, and Scala gives us a nice tail rec annotation that transforms our loops into um, our our tail recursive our, our self tail recursive calls into loops. It's pretty cool, and we can do that with task as well. And this works for asynchronous things. Um, this also works for for asynchronous computations. And we have also been able to do that with um, with future. We often do that with future. Um, just a note that um, tasks implementation is uh, has a has a stack safe and memory safe uh, flat map implementation so you can do such loops uh, at will and um, that 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 sample used defer instead of flat map this sample uses flat map so you can describe any kind of loop you you want with flat map and it has a really efficient implementation that um, um, that is uh, memory safe, and you can also do um, mutual re tail recursion. So you can have, also in functional programming, we, you end up with functions that describes that describe states in a state machine. And I mean, the functions themselves are state, and those the function calls are transitions. Uh, this is, happens especially in compiler implementations. And if you do manual tail recursion, Task can also handle it, right? This also works with future because of future's implementation. As a project policy, and this is a, this is a reference to um, the uh, Scala Z's task um, that inspired me to make Monix task is that the task implementation, this task implementation, does not expose booby traps. Booby traps, in the context of functional programming, means especially stack overflow errors. So uh, task does not expose, um, this task implementation does not expose unsafe operations. Um, for example, when you create 
an asynchronous uh, task reference that signals a value. In order for this to be safe, you have to introduce asynchronous boundaries um, before executing your logic and then a second one before calling the final callback because such, such things can be changed to get together and you can uh, uh, easily reach a stack overflow error. Uh, this loop described right here would, would trigger a stack overflow error in um, uh, Scala Z's task implementation. Um, and it's really not obvious why you have to actually be knowledgeable about such things to realize it, but Monix protects you, right? The Monix task implementation protects against this use case. There's actually an unsafe create method on it done for those that know what they are doing, so um, it does give you doorways, but it's usually pretty safe that has been um, that has been um, a guarantee of the project. Another another operation that is uh, has been problematic is the map both implementation, which executes tasks in parallel. Um, it's like the applicative map. Too, but it executes stuff in parallel. So, I mean, it can do that. Um, and the map both implementation in Monix can be used in loops with, without um, stack overflow concerns. Um, this is a loop that is equivalent to the future sequence in Scala that takes a list of tasks and returns a task of list. Um, I just implemented it in terms of map both, and this particular operation is called gather, so um, you do task gather and it will trigger a parallel execution of the list of tasks that, that you give it. Okay. Future has the execution context that is responsible for triggering the synchronous boundaries. It's backed by a thread pool, or by set timeout, set interval in, in JavaScript. Uh, but it's not really about threads, it's about a synchronous execution. And what I needed here was to expand on that, so Monix is an, an ex, a scheduler that extends execution context that is able to trigger execution with, with delays. This is great for doing timeouts and stuff and it also injects some execution parameters. It can inject the current time, so instead of doing system current time millis, uh, you can get that from the scheduler, and the scheduler can provide different implementations. Maybe you need, maybe you need uh, nano time or uh, something that um, uh, is safer to use than system current time millis for measuring time, and maybe you need to do testing uh, testing that is deterministic, and um, doing time-based stuff uh, can, can be done by means of the scheduler. And you, it's basically a drop-in replacement, um, and the default scheduler implementation actually piggybacks Scala's own global thread pool, so it works with fork join pool and so on. Um, it basically has extra stuff in it that is, can be useful. And the scheduler implementation is, instead of being picked on every operation of the, of the task, it's, it's only required when you're triggering the execution. So it, it, it gets injected uh, uh, wherever required, but you only need when you actually execute the task. This is in charge of the evaluation, so you don't, you don't have to um, have that execution context implicitly on every operation that you describe. Um, uh, run, run async takes the scheduler implicitly from the context, but you can specify it explicitly, of course. And you can play with it. So you can say, I want this part of the task to execute on some, sch on some scheduler meant for executing I.O. operations. So this could be like so something that doesn't have the maximum number of threads bounded to some maximum value um, for doing blocking stuff. And then you can introduce an asynchronous boundary to jump back to the default scheduler, 
which is meant for doing CPU bound stuff. Um, so Executon is about uh, shifting the execution uh, uh, before that instruction uh, that is described before this instruction and the sync boundary is for what happens afterwards. So that map um, execution will happen on the default scheduler instead of the IO one. And you can, well, you can do things explicitly. The implicit one is taken in, in run async, but you can override it for a certain pass of that computation. And the morning says task has, a, has an interesting execution model. Um, speaking of future, future um, provides um, fairness in its execution, meaning that if you, if you schedule something to execute, like a transformation of some result, um, you will probably not um, have an unlimited delay there because the execution is managed by a thread pool like the fork join pool, which was built to provide maybe certain fairness guarantees. So often in practice, you end up doing um, some, some trade-offs between fairness and, and um, uh, performance throughput. Um, so future has a fair, um, provides fairness, but sometimes the throughput suffers because in operations like map, fat map, and so on, it ends up sending runnables in the thread pool. And the Monix task implementation does batch, stuff in batches by default. So when it end up, ends up doing a flat map um, run loops, uh, it has like a, an internal counter that keeps incrementing and when over a certain threshold, it, it ends up forking um, the, the current thread. So it ends up sending a runnable in the thread pool. And so it, it keeps, uh, it has a pretty good throughput and um, it, it also provides some fairness granted. This is about, you know, cooperative multi-threading. You can't have, it's pretty bad to have like a loop that processes stuff to keep uh, the current thread occupied forever. And this is less, maybe less visible in normal apps on the JVM where you've got multi-threading, but especially in JavaScript, this kills your user interface, right? You can have uh, freezes uh, in the user interface and those are directly visible to the customer and so on. Um, and JavaScript de developers actually deal with this. But it's configurable, so you can have, you can have, um, um, you can have uh, a configuration injected to specify that uh, the task should, should fork the current thread on each, on each iteration of that loop, or you can, you can have a configuration that says keep this uh, execution on the current thread for as long as possible, like the Scala Z task is behaving. Um, by default, it's batched, and, but you can configure the scheduler to inject that execution model in, in the task implementation when, when being executed. So you can say always async or prefer synchronous execution for as long as possible. By default, it does stuff in batching. Right. In case you're wondering, I'm not talk going to talk about trampolines. Um, I'm going to talk about what a synchrony means. I already uh, said about it. I, I, I've already talked about it a little at the beginning. So it's about uh, things that execute outside the current call stack, maybe outside the current process. Um, this would be the, the normal signature of an asynchronous process. And if you'll, if you'll pay attention, you'll end up seeing it everywhere, including in ACA actors. Um, basically, something that um, receives a start, it's like a, an external process that receives a start message, and then in, it receives a callback that is going to be called when that computation is finished. And we like to pretend that this function signature is possible and a good idea, right? So um, something that takes a future result and transforms it into an, an immediate one that we, we can use. And 
something that turns a synchrony into synchronous execution. So on top of the JVM, we block threads for doing it. Um, other implementations like various small talk or scheme implementations have uh, continuation support. We also have Scala async, which rewrites your code to pretend that this is possible. But it's, in general, a platform-specific hack that's also not portable. Um, I usually prefer to use things for what they are. Uh, asynchrony is not synchronous, right? We, we need better tools to deal with composition than to block threads, especially because it is fairly inefficient and error-prone. So if I actually had this in production, uh, if you have a limited thread pool with a finite number of threads in it, um, you can end up with threads being blocked for callbacks that have nowhere to execute because all, all of the threads are blocked, so basically sort of a deadlock. Uh, I, I had uh, an, an application frozen because of this, um, which is why blocking I/O needs to be deferred to another thread pool usually. It's recommended, let's say. So um, we don't, uh, the task implementation doesn't expose any blocking operations, just mentioning. Um, to turn some, some asynchronous process into a task, uh, this is basically the, the equivalent of using a promise, but you give it a function that it can execute on run async, and that function will have a callback injected. That callback will, will uh, can then be called to with the final result of the computation. So in this case, we are using the scheduler to, ex to delay the execution of a function. And it's cancelable, so you can return a cancelable reference that can be in charge of canceling this operation if possible. Turning a future is similar. You basically turn, use on complete, and when that will run, you can call your callback with an success on or on error. Futures can't be canceled, it's in their API, so we are not going to pretend that we can. Um, of course, this is already in the API, so the future interoperability is pretty good, right? You can turn, of, uh, you can, you can turn futures into tasks and vice versa. Uh, we can defer or delay the execution, uh, so you've got from future, defer, defer future. Um, and then we, <coughs> I mean, task run async, uh, one of the overloads, one of the two overloads uh, returns a future back at you, so you can use that to block on it or something. Of course, this, this was a trap for you, right? We aren't supposed to block. But, but if we end up blocking, it's, it's good to rely on the standard Scala library because it has something called a block context that then informs the thread pool that you're doing a dangerous operation such that it might maybe add threads in that thread pool, which is why the, what the global fork join pool is doing. Um, and it's good that it makes you specify a timeout. So APIs that block and that don't make you specify a timeout are evil, in my opinion. So I already mentioned the future interoperability, which is pretty good, but speaking of taking that execution context all over the place, let's, let's go through an exercise and transform this future-based API into something that uses that. So we've got an increment that, that increments some shared state. We can describe that in terms of task by deferring that future. So defer future will, will uh, make that lazy We'll make that function called lazy, so it's going to correspond to task semantics. And, but we still have the execution context, right? But as we've seen, we've already um, taken that scheduler in run async, and we can inject it. So we also have something called defer future action, which can give you that execution context. So you can hide that in, in the final task reference, because you don't need that execution context until you, execute, you actually execute the task. So you no longer need to carry that around everywhere uh, until you actually execute it, and you execute that at the end of the world somewhere. So, um, cancelables. 
there's like an ongoing debate in the Scala community, should tasks be cancelable or not? I believe they should be. Um, because um, in practice, resource leak is, um, is a problem. And if you take a look at the task API, um, when you call run async, I told you that it gives you a future. Well, it actually gives you a cancelable future. And the other um, methods for executing it also give you, gives you a cancelable reference. Cancelable really is what it sounds like, so it's like closable in Java, disposable in .NET, and so on. And we inherit from future, right? We, had, we just add the cancel method on it. Of course, um, Right, so when, when you trigger the execution, if you change your mind later due to certain reasons like race conditions, you can simply cancel it. Or maybe you want to close some process or something. You want to do resource cleanup. Um, and I've already shown you this example. Um, in, in the task create implementation, you simply return something that knows how to cancel your computation. And this is optional. Some, some things cannot be, cannot be canceled, which is fine. Um, this is opt-in. Some APIs will be able to cancel stuff. Some APIs will not be able to cancel stuff. Um, and this is useful because in, in implementations like choose for stuff, which is a function that creates a race condition between two tasks and picks the winner, you might want to cancel the other one. So in the, in the task implementation, choose for stuff, we'll, we'll give you the winner, either this or that, or, and it will give you the cancelable future of the other one. And you can choose to do something with it, like maybe try to cancel it, or maybe you could use re its result. Maybe you're confident that it will also complete and try to use that result somehow. But this choose for stuff and then mapping over it and then canceling the one that lost is how timeout is basically implemented. Um, you can, right, this is how timeout is basically implemented. So you can, you can implement timeouts with this stuff and if tasks can be canceled, then it's going to do a resource cleanup as well. And I mentioned future sequence. The problem with future sequence is that all of the futures, um, it will wait on all of the futures to finish before signaling your final result, even if one of them fails, even if you are going to receive a, uh, an exception for it. Uh, tasks implementation will try to cancel the rest and give you that result immediately, um, that, that error immediately. Choose first of list will also cancel the unfinished when, when one of them wins the race. When you describe loops, you also have the opportunity to make it cancelable automatically, right? So you can do something like calculate Fibonacci or something, and something useful for humankind. And you can make that cancelable, which is going to be a Boolean that's going to be interrogated. But this is not done by default because it's an unsafe operation, actually, because you might want to specify stuff to be, like file handles to be closed at the end and so on. And by having loops cancelable, um, such logic will be basically useless. So this is an opt-in. You, you specify it as an execution option, which is, which is what happens in this example. You have to enable auto-cancelable run loops. Uh, and speaking of cancellation, the, the thing with cancel is that it's a concurrent operation with, with the task's execution, which can create problems, which is why nothing is cancelable by default. You have to supply logic for it. And uh, one, one final note, uh, Scala Z's task implementation has canceling, but uh, it's problematic. So um, the, the, the implementation in, in Monix is, is really robust, so um, you should definitely check that out. If I, I believe if, if there's a right cancelable uh, implementation, then Monix's implementation is it. Error handling. 
So uh, we, when, when doing a synchronous processing, we need really good error handling because if things are going to blow up, they are going to blow up on some thread somewhere, and if you're not dealing with it, then you know, nobody is going to hear that. So we have the user handle with, and you give, you give it a function, and depending on the type of the exception, you can try to fall back on another task. But I already told you that task is a function that can be retried, so in case, in case something happened, we can simply choose to retry it repeatedly until some end condition happens, right? Because it's a function, we can keep retrying it safely, and we can also implement should we need retry with back off, right? Because it's a when 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 the producer you're communicating with has problems, it's a pretty big, it's a pretty bad idea to to keep retrying immediately. So maybe you want to do delays that maybe are incrementing, and maybe increment that delay, right? So you you can model basically a recursive loop. So handle with um, behaves like flat map and it's stack safe and you can you can retry it repeatedly uh, with a delay of one second two seconds four seconds eight seconds and so on uh, and you also have um, time based operations like timeout baked in this would have been useful on future but fut uh, the Scala standard library currently misses a scheduler um, so Basically, this creates a race condition between your source and something that will complete um, the result with a timeout exception or a fallback, if you will. I've been told that you have to put cat pictures in your presentation. <laughs> so, some primitives provided for doing concurrency handling in Monix, uh, the Monix eval uh, subproject. We have an asynchronous semaphore implementation based on task that will limit the parallelism of your, of your tasks. So this really is like a semaphore that will, that will limit your, concurrent, your parallel execution to 16 in this example, um, meaning that incoming tasks are going to wait for the currently active ones to finish if there are more than 16 of them. Um, and usage is pretty easy. You basically have a task in your hand and you have to green light it for this is this is useful for all sorts of things like limiting parallel requests, for example, to an API that has limits um, for doing calls or something. Um, but by the way, for complicated scenarios, it's better to do to work with streaming and back pressure. Uh, just FYI, task semaphore is for simple cases. Uh, we also have a circuit breaker, which is, was inspired by the one in Aka. So Aka has a pretty cool circuit breaker that works with actors, which uh, in case the source, in case the, the node you're speaking with, with has problems, it, after a certain amount of failures, it will enter into a state in which it will, it will reject uh, all incoming uh, requests for a certain time span, and afterwards it will it will let one request go through, um, and if that succeeds, then it's going to that circuit breaker is going to call close again and allow all incoming requests again. This is basically to protect that service that has problems. Because, for example, if your database is having problems because of the load, it's a pretty bad idea to, to, to push requests in it, right? So this is for protecting that, that node. And the implementation in Aka works with actors, this one works with task. You can um, protect, right. MVAR is another uh, concurrency uh, abstraction. Uh, it behaves like a blocking queue of size one. Um, but it works with tasks, so it's asynchronous. It has a totally non-blocking implementation, and uh, I'm not going to um, go into too many details. It's an abstraction that comes from Haskell, basically, and you can use it to uh, do synchronized mutable variables, uh, to, to model asynchronous locks, or to do really simple producer-consumer channels. And 
there is a, an article on the website about it, and I encourage you to look at that for more details. Um, yeah, so this was it. Those are the um, links. Um, so that's the morning's website, which has documentation and API documentation. I, I tried to provide good API documentation. Task is really well documented, observable, not so much. Uh, I, I hope to fix that. Um, Twitter handles, GitHub handles. So, and that one is me. I rant a lot, sorry about that, but um, yeah. Any questions? No? Israel, I was very clear where I've lost you somewhere along the way. <laughs> yeah. So yeah, um, I encourage you to check out that um, website and um, also we have we have a Gitter channel. I'm I I try to to respond to requests. Um, yeah. <laughs> so if you have feedback. Oh, and I also have stickers. So I haven't mentioned in the beginning, but the the Monix logo is. This is like a hexagon to, to fit with, with the other type level projects. So, so you, you can basically uh, like do something like this on your laptop, right? And I, I've got some stickers here if you want. <laughs>